So I'm Zoe Freeney and I'm um, an artist, um, painter, drawings, some video work and um, actually iPhone photographs and video as well is useful in my work. Um, yeah, so you can see behind me just a few things that I've got up in the studio. I haven't sort of curated it for today. I'm just, um, you know, what you see <laughs> is what it's like at the moment. Yes. Um, and yeah, so I am, uh, a lot of this work's being produced as um, part of a PhD project. And the main focus of that is studio research into, um, uh, <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> no, um, um, depicting alternative images of mothers and the work they do, as opposed wow. to the, you know, the flattened um, images in the media of the yummy mummy and um, that kind of thing as well. Um, so that's an academic. Yeah, PhD. that's through the ANU in Canberra. Um, okay. Yeah, so most of the work that. Well, the images I sent through to you and the work in the studio at the moment is related to that. Um, yeah. So, would you like to start with? Um, we're going to start with sort of what what are you working on right now, apart from a PhD? Yeah. Yep. And okay. when you and just let me know if you want me to pull an image up, so um, or if you want to work from them. Well, I guess you could pull up one of the images mm -hmm. that's easy on your phone or what you're working from yep um otherwise i could share my screen i've got a few images oh okay on my own screen do you want me to do that yeah i'll make you a co-host we've got the three images there that you sent yeah but um I will, that might be nice. Um, I'll make you a co-host so you can share your screen. Brilliant. Okay, so let's see if that works. There we go. Can you see Fantastic. that? Fantastic, yeah. Great. Resolution. So if I put that into slideshow. Okay, so uh, this is like an earlier iteration of the studio I'm sitting in now, um, which I put in, I think one of the questions was where, where are you working now? So it yep. sort of relates to that as well. So I'm in um, Collective Haunt on the parade at Norwood um, and there's like 23 of, 23 artists in this space and we've each got our own allocated space um and yeah so this is this must be taken about 2018 I reckon um and so some of the work like this painting here is an early one so the PhD I started in 2016 I reckon and this was one of the earlier paintings that I made um for that project so I started off looking at how um, the mother's identity can be sort of obscured or subsumed by um, motherhood you know and I often use toys and just stuff around the house and pets as well to um, stand in for the children so in this painting I'm like holding it all up and it's covered you can't see me um, because I'm sort of lost in all of it. Um, and then this painting here, I actually forgot about until I saw this photo, but this isn't really part of the project except to the extent that it's all wrapped in. But this is my eldest son um, who actually went to kindy with Jane Mance's son. <laughs> oh, that's why you said it's so and someone's mum. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that, it, yeah. Um, Zephyr, who is going to be 18 in a couple of months. So it's like the end of my PhD will coincide with him the end of his childhood if you like although he's still a bit <laughs> he's got a few years to go I think <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and this painting is just of the kitchen sink so part of the project is um 
you know, I don't want it to look like drudgery, like this motherhood thing is, uh, you know, woe is me. I also um, trying to value, you know, the everyday and the small moments. And um, also that painting was a reaction to a, a thing I read in a women's magazine that said something like, um, need a break, do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> The warm water is so relaxing and, the, you know, the beautiful smell of the detergent will I don't, stimulate your senses or, <laughs> right. you know, really rubbish. But actually, I've got a beautiful view out there. I live in the Adelaide Hills. So, it, you know, taking notice of the little moments every day. Beautiful. Great to see in your studio. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go through to the next. This is what the studio now looks like. It's looking into the same corner of the studio and it's nice to see how the work is accruing, I think, and, you know, layering up. Oh, um, wow. There's that early painting and then all the other stuff around. Um, and there's Zephyr again. So this is one of the most recent drawings, which will be um, in the PhD exhibition and I'm you can't really see but I'm standing on a little plastic chair and so that I'm taller than him and we're sort of drawing each other um because you know that's the other point about the my research is that um motherhood is so devalued in western culture and in the art world and I'm trying to show that it can be a generative place to work from <laughs> I'm just getting my laptop so keep talking great um what else to say the body is really important in my work as well so um you know a lot of western enlightenment thought is about um reason and the mind and um even feminism itself in you know around the 1970s was very much against women's women artists using their bodies because that could be seen as objectifying bodies. But um, I'm very much about like your your inner body in the world, and the way I experience the world is is through my body. And um, mothering as well is a really physical thing, or caring. I mean, I keep saying mothering, but it could extend to any kind of care work. And, you know, the physical demands are so intense that I try and show that. Um, I don't know if you can see this drawing very well, but I'm holding a pile of melons. And in this drawing as well, you know, the melons represent women's body parts, but also the like the weight of them that we're expected to hold up and to balance. And, um, yeah, so... I don't know if you get that sense looking around the studio, but it's really, they're not meant to be self-portraits. They're just meant to show a body, <laughs> you know, going through these motions. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the next... Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. I can, next... I can direct you into spaces or you can take us there. It's up to yeah, you. Yeah, I think the next photos I've got are more about the collaboration aspect, which is Beautiful. the last question. So yep. um, if you want me to stop sharing and you could put up the other images if you want. Mm -hmm. or... Okay. Okay. So I think if I just take over. Yeah. Oh, you can see in the background here, um, I don't know if you noticed that um, green monster head behind me. Um, I've got to see there, that. There yep. it is. So that's a paper mache um, costume that I made for book week. You know, the kids came home and said, oh, it's book week in two days. <laughs> so, you know, out with the paper mache. And, and these wings actually were as well. So sort of aspects of um creativity that is just part of mothering I come into the work as well um and I've drawn myself wearing that monster head and um it's interesting on Facebook this week lots of my friends with younger kids were posting um 
their cost their kids in costumes for book week and mine don't do that anymore and it just was a reminder of um I don't know the temporality of motherhood you know that it's so the cliche it's so brief um yeah the seasons that you go through I suppose yeah so here's now I know now I understand this image of you standing on a chair with a pile of toys right this yeah <laughs> so um this is a photo photograph which uh -huh. um, yeah so I use photos as source material um but sometimes they're better than the actual works I think so <laughs> so with this one I blue tacked my phone to the back of a chair and set the timer function and then had to oh and another pressure was that I knew my father-in-law was arriving at any time so there's this just got to get this done so set the timer run I'm only wearing no. undies stand on the chair hold up all those toys which I'm pretty sloppy like I'd tie them together but they're all falling apart take the photo put it down get off the chair check if the photo is any good you know so there's a series of these photos that might be works in themselves because that, I, there is definitely that urgency in it somehow <laughs> yes. little details like the way the toes are on the edge of the chair and this chair yeah. was like oh it, not very strong I could feel the legs sort of sliding out and um what a metaphor yeah yeah and hopefully it's a bit funny as well um well the giant duck probably helps with that <laughs> <laughs> for a head yeah yeah I actually thought it was your daughter I thought your legs no. are very <laughs> very yeah. useful no I've only got two boys no daughters so um <laughs> okay <laughs> the legs but they are supposed to, I mean obviously they're just the legs I've got so I have to deal with them but they're also <laughs> like I think they look vulnerable you know like because yes they do and, um yeah the only thing about see when you use a photograph I don't really ever want to photoshop these hastily taken photograph so I've just got to go with what's there and our house is a bit unusual um it's built of straw bales and it's got weird little things like this window at the top and um you know when I paint from a photo like that I can edit it to make it look more um I guess I want to make the surroundings look a bit more generic so that everyone can um relate to them so the top drawing you can see um I've actually taken the photograph of the top drawing in the studio uh oh this top the, yeah the one where I'm yes drawing. okay yeah. cool and then I, in the drawing as well I can sort of pair back the background so it's less um confusing or yeah <laughs> that's a huge pastel yeah uh it is big um which was exciting um yeah you know to challenge myself to go that big the background is like an acrylic um gesso kind of primer stuff and then yeah the pastels over the top of that oh yeah. wow yeah good fun drawing big but um really right frightening yeah a bit frightening and tricky to deal with as objects um so one of them I was taking down to make room to put it start another one and I tore it because you know the paper's heavy and it's I'm a bit clumsy and <laughs> yeah so they're not very forgiving sort of objects and you're on a plastic chair again um, yeah the plastic chair there's quite a few things that repeat throughout the project so the plastic chair pops up a few times um different toys are there again and again um, which is I think important because it's they're the, the things that have you know I've lived with for the last almost 20 years now they're, you know everyday life um yeah cool yeah which looks kind of which has that if it sort of has an effect because you've got these traditional mediums with sort of everyday st still life objects you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's a good point and I think that's part of what I'm trying to do is to um 
say that these everyday things are important and valuable and deserve to be taken into that art realm. That's, like and mothers. I think that's, yeah, that's why they're big as well. Like I don't really think big works are better than little works, but I do feel like um, it's a previously was a really masculine, you know, the hero artist mm. made these grand works. And I feel like, yeah, well, I'm a mum and I'm doing a million other things and I can make big works as well. That's exciting. Yeah. 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 So could you then like move maybe into the question about how do you balance, a, you know, an art practice and life? Yep. Um, so I feel like it's all a bit haphazard. I'm on leave at the moment from my job, um, which is um, I'm the head of art history and theory at the Central School of Art. Um, and yeah, so I'm on leave from teaching and admin and I've got a bit more time um, so the balance isn't quite as difficult, but um, yeah, I, it's it's really tricky. Um, I was listening to a podcast last night called Artist Mother Podcast. Um, yeah, out of America. And yeah, it was sort of just saying all the same stuff, you know, that you know, the balance and the juggle and, um, you know, uh, the presenter has interviewed all these different artists, mothers over the last couple of years. And I mean, the only thing really that links them is that they're mothers and they might not share a lot in common apart from that. And so they have different ways of coping with that um, juggle and balance um, as we all do, I think. I think it's pretty rare that anyone has the luxury of being a studio artist nine to five yeah. five days a week um well we wouldn't need video conferences at <laughs> right. sala for for two hours yeah uh, for two on uh, over two days to discuss how to do that juggle that's yeah. right yeah yeah um so really the phd started for me because i wanted to try and find um well a couple of things my art practice always came at the bottom of my list of things to do and so I wanted to formalize it as a kind of study so that um, I put it to the top myself you know often it's I'm my own worst enemy I'm the one who let it drop to the bottom of the list so thought well if if I'm value it as study and research then I have to do it <laughs> so um, that's a serious commitment yeah that's right yeah yeah um, and it's, I think, for myself to take it seriously more than anybody else, you know, so that um, I don't let it drop to the bottom. Uh, and then, like, my first question was, how can <clears throat> someone be a mother and an artist? <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, yeah, I mean, that question sort of got answered because I was doing it. So it, it just means doing it. I think however however that however you do it you just got to keep doing it and that might mean um you know making play-doh dinosaurs with the kids um it might mean making cubby house um you know out of sheets and chairs in the lounge room like that's all creative stuff as well and um cool. just because that's not valued by the art market doesn't mean that it's not important um yeah, yeah. so one year I think it was 2012 I made one tiny painting in the whole year and at the time that was quite painful like I felt I'm not an artist anymore <laughs> but looking back of course I can see um actually that was just a really busy time and I was doing all those other things like play-doh squids <laughs> and um yeah finger painting and and book week costumes and whatever um so I don't know if I've found an answer or even answered your question but I think well you made a PhD out of it right exactly yeah I think that <laughs> that's, was a, that's probably an answer yeah that was a strategy was to okay let's value it for myself and try and 
uh, hopefully the, the PhD is quite political as well. You know, it's not just about yeah. me as a mum and blah, blah, blah. It's like this work in society, this free labour that mostly women do as carers needs to be seen and valued. Um, and COVID as well showed at least... Um, you know, in Anglo-American societies um, and probably more broadly as well that, um, you know, things fall back so easily along gendered lines. So, you know, feminist motherhood has um, gained a lot of momentum and mothers feel empowered and can choose to work or not work. And But then with COVID, um, Often it was just unspoken within families that the woman went back into that full-time caring and teaching role mm. in my family as well. My husband was working <laughs> in a not a very nice little space that we've got, but still he was working almost nine to five and I was doing all the other stuff. Yeah, just I, had, I had friends that were teachers who were teaching and looking after four-year-olds yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, my sister's boss um, in one of the lockdowns, my sister's got little toddlers and she was told that she still had to keep up, um, you know, productivity or, you know, meet the targets working at home with children, at, you know. So uh, it's, I'm not sure how to change that. but um, uh, And I don't have you know this idea that art can change it but hopefully my project is a little um makes a step in that direction yeah is the work that with the dugon behind you that was on instagram is that yeah. part of the, the project? um yes and no i just um yeah it sort of is but not centrally so i sewed this little dugon toy from one of my nieces um, and it just made me think of, um, there's a Da Vinci painting called Lady and the Ermine, and it's this noble woman, although she wasn't a noble woman, she was a bit lower down, but she was a mistress of a noble man, and she was eventually cast off in favour of a more high-born woman. Anyway, the portrait is, um, she's holding an ermine, in this, which is like a white um, weasel stoty thing. Um, and so I guess this one is more a self-portrait of playing on that idea of the, you know, the master painting, uh, whereas the other works are not really self-portraits. So, yeah, I, I'd have to work quite hard to write that one into the project. <laughs> yeah. And the, the last image on your three slides yep. uh, in the laundromat, I think. Yes. That's part of the mother. I'll just pull it up so we can see it. I love it. There's something very futuristic about it. And with the washing machine or the dryers in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so perhaps I'll start talking about that one while it's... <laughs> coming here, <laughs> here it, it comes yeah yeah so again this started as a series of photos and a video as well um I I do spend quite a lot of time in the laundromat still because I also run a Airbnb and I'm frequently doing linen in the oh god laundromat but it it does remind me I also used cloth nappies and so it's <laughs> it's like oh I'm still here um and so I had a lot of thinking time um, in the laundromat. And again, it's it's like a really physical um, thing. The laundromat I go to has a sticker on the wall telling about the history of doing the laundry and how women used to spend all day washing. And um, now it's so simple. You, you know, it takes however long in the laundromat, but it's still a really physical thing. And I made a video where I took the laundry in and put it in the dryer and did a headstand in the laundromat for the um seven minutes that it took to dry the clothes um to again show like the the balance and the 
kind of duration, the endurance of motherhood. Um, and then I just lay down. <laughs> and I then I painted this part of it because I just think um, it's so unexpected. You know, you, you think of um, carers, mothers performing in certain ways in public. They're always working, you know, at the playground or the laundromat or a cafe. I was just in a cafe and the mums are all feeding the kids, you know, at the same time as they're always working. And so to show the actual exhaustion behind that, I thought would be good. And the and, title kind of. Yeah, gentle, the gentle hum. hum. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, you know, that's the hum of the dryers, but also of everyday life. And also um, this is, it could be a pile of washing or a kid in a bunny suit, you know, this presence is always there like a kind of a gentle hum as well you know okay. even if the kids aren't with you they're still sort of there uh you're never an individual again in the same way that you were before you had kids I think oh how lovely it is to hear you talk about this work <laughs> yeah it's really nice to get to know it oh thanks <laughs> um, and the last section we were kind of keen to hear about was um was collaboration and what works for you what what makes a collaborative um god a collaborative experience for you rich yeah um so in some of my works I collaborate with the kids um you know so their I their presence is either always there or sometimes I get them to take photos for me um if, you know of landscapes and things around the house and um uh, I have this tendency in my work I think to tidy things up and and if I use a photo that the kids have taken it's blurry and unexpected and you know especially when they're younger I'd say and can you get this in the picture and you know they cut the head off or, or whatever um, right exactly yep yep um just the other day I was driving and we go up um, the old Belair Road past Brown Hill and it was you know this golden light in the the evening light with the storm clouds <laughs> I said Aquilo quick quick take a photo of that and he's when I got home there's all these photos of just like the trees yeah. and and a close-up of the traffic barrier <laughs> um, so I like that kind of accident that kids can bring to the work oh um, nice yeah and the other project that I've collaborated in or one of another project um is the South Australian artists for uh, climate action um and as that group we ran this um uh climate badges campaign where we got together and um thought about what we could do as artists using our own individual skills and practices to make some kind of a difference, you know, or make our feelings known about um, what we thought our leaders should be doing towards climate protection. And um, yeah, so we, I mean, it wasn't a, uh, a close collaboration because part of the idea was that we could use our own practices to make these badges but the idea was collaborative um and yeah so I sent some badges that I made they're little bird paintings and I sent um one to David Attenborough and he replied with a hand wow cool yes um which was a highlight um and I sent another one to Bob Brown and um Oh, who else? Um, Flannery, Tim Flannery as well. Um, Nikki Cumpston at the Art Gallery of South Australia. She's a great advocate for the um, Murray Darling. And yeah, so that um, it's still sort of going along in the in the background. And I feel like we'll reactivate that when um, when my PhD is over. Um, but another great collaborative project I did was in India. Um, uh, this exchange or this this um, 
uh, was part of a trade mission that the government was doing. And Daniel Connell, um, who's a Adelaide artist, um, had this idea that there should be a cultural component of the trade mission. And so a bunch of us artists went over there and collaborated with school children um, running workshops. And then also in Jaipur, um, we collaborated with um, professional artists there as well as students to, um, you know, the end wow. result was an exhibition. Yeah, but I mean, the exhibition was great, but it wasn't really the point. The point was the talking and the understanding that was generated through the process. That yeah. certainly raises ideas around the role of the artist and yeah yeah how wonderful yeah. yeah it was great I mean doing this PhD project is very much um like a solo kind of apart from my family that is along for the ride <laughs> it's you know feels quite um inward looking in lots of ways whereas that kind of um real collaborative process was very rewarding and um yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Well, um, I think there's some comments and we've got like half an hour if there's some questions. So, and we've also got a feedback link there for people that are joining us. Um, I like the thought that making Play-Doh and Book Week costumes is still art, as I did that a good few years from Jane. And it's lovely to see what Zoe's up to these days. I'd love to visit the Collective Haunt Studios. Yay. So is there anyone that has questions? I mean, yeah, I have heaps, but there might be some coming from, from our I've audience. <laughs> Go, um, Donna. So, hi, Zoe. Hi. I really, really loved the underwear that you made a little while ago. I'd oh, love yes. you to talk a little bit about that, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. And I've got an image. Should I share my screen again? um that'd be great go for it all right so there uh okay so the underwear started actually with this mother suit i've called it um which is made out of painter's linen so i thought i'd go and buy this linen and i'd stretch it and prime it and paint on it and i just oh my god i just couldn't get it done um, and so I, uh, I'm a self-taught sewer and I also, um, uh, it, it's got other overlaying meanings because my great grandma was a seamstress and then, um, my mum didn't sew and hated sewing. And I think it was because she was a feminist and, you know, so she wasn't going to sew and, and I, then I taught myself on my great grandma's treadle sewing machine. And I feel like it's like this matrilineal connection that was broken. Um, and like, good on mum for not, you know, she had four kids and, you know, looked after us all. And I'm, I'm glad she didn't feel like she had to sew as well. Um, but I'm using it as a creative strategy, I guess. So the sewing took me back to those matrilineal connections and also you know painting is is the hard thing like being a mum the setting up the preparation the I don't know I've made so many paintings in my head that will never get made because it's too hard um, but I could use this linen instead I could just get the sewing machine out at home and and make this suit and it's like it's supposed to be a suit to wear when you mother, when you do that work, but also when you paint, you know, like a coverall or an apron type thing. Um, and then, so then I had the suit, then I thought I'd be ready to go and do the painting. Um, and then, yeah, was it last April, the COVID lockdown happened and I couldn't get to the studio and, um, I thought, okay, I'll get out the sewing machine again. And and what's uh, what would a painter wear under their jumpsuit was <laughs> what I I thought. Um, oh, okay. What about yeah? Use this linen to make underwear, which talks because it's so rough and heavy and structured. It I, it's really useful to talk about the 
the structures of society, you know, the ideals of motherhood that structure our behaviours and even our bodies, you know, the idea of what the mother should look like, which then puts more pressure on, you know, you don't have to just do work and mothering. There's like a third shift of body work or fitness or whatever. Um, yeah, so I made this maternity bra that's underwired and it turns out there's a whole um, thing of people making their own bras, you know, so you can just online find the, all the trimmings and everything you need. Um, yeah, so it's, that's where that idea came from, was the, the structuring of the body. But um, then that led to this research into the history of underwear and this fascinating um, archaeological find in 2008 in an Austrian castle of a linen bra that's the first example of a bra with separate cups from like the 12th century or something. Um, and there's this paradox in garment design that you know, isn't that great that women had supportive garments? But then there's all this stuff um, from documents from that time talking about the ideal woman's body, you know, breasts shouldn't be too big. And if they are, they need to be put in bags and strapped to the body. And, you know, so it's not, it might be about comfort, but it's also about control. So that's what the underwear is about. Yeah. Thanks, Zoe. I love that. Um, <laughs> Great story. I, I've made my own bras. And <laughs> when I saw what you were doing, I thought that was brilliant. Love it. Oh, thanks. Well, it, uh, I haven't done one for a few months now. And I'm um, because they're artworks, I'm sort of relieved of the need to make them actually fit me. <laughs> <laughs> I, because it would be a very... Um, Oh, it would take exact me long science. Time. Exact <laughs> science. They are the words I'm looking for. Yes. But if you could do it, it would you'd end up with a very comfortable bra, I think, if you persisted. <laughs> It'd certainly help you with book week costumes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also wondering about did you did you say how long you've been doing your PhD? Is uh, it? Yep. So I started in 2016. Okay. And I'm not as old as your son because it sounded like you'd been doing it for 18 years, but you mean. Right. No, no. <laughs> um, the, there's the first work. I'm going to be a bit cheeky and include it in the PhD, but say that it's like floats outside of the PhD, was made the year that he was born. So I'm sort of stretching time because like time is a weird thing. And, you know, when you've got, well, for this project, I keep going back to baby photos and the present and memory and it, um, yeah. So the project, no, has not been going 18 years, but, <laughs> but my mothering has, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to have them run alongside each other. Yeah. Is there any other um, any other questions? Oh, should I stop sharing the screen? Uh, unless you've got something else you want to show us. Uh, oh, just the pictures from the Climate Badges project. Oh, that that'd I'm be great. Yep. Um, so uh, it's on Instagram and so we were... Um, asking artists to make a badge and then photograph it and send it with a letter um, to the person they thought was doing great work um, towards oh, cool. um, environmental protection rather than, um, yeah, so it had a positive um, focus. And so this is a poster that we made that showed some of those examples. So there's Sarah Waters, Sue Kneebone made these gorgeous wooden whales. Um, this is the one I sent to Nikki Cumpston, Deidre Butt her same, Julia Robinson, Amy Joy Watson, uh, and others, lots of others. And um, we were invited to send that to this um, 
woman who runs this project called the Notice Board Gallery, I think, um, in, I think it's Uffington in the UK. And she's got this notice board outside her house and a flagpole. And so she displayed the Climate Badges project information and a flag that we made that um, is the, uh, what's that language called when you talk with flags? Semaphore, is that right? Um, and so the flag says, this first one is signaling, I wish to communicate to you, H-O-P-E, hope. So it had this hope oh. to keep up the good work. And yeah, so that's still active on Instagram. Um, yeah, just ticking along, waiting for the next um, part of the, the process. And we encouraged um, anyone to run a badge making workshop um, and think about who would you send a badge to? Um, well, it was kind of the topic yesterday um, after Louise Flaherty talked because um, another artist asked about how do you not get sort of bogged down and in the whole mental health aspect of looking at and so this is like a perfect sort of action yeah yeah um what we'd noticed was uh, and we did also run an art auction um uh to was to raise money for communities who were um, impacted by the bushfires of 2019 and 2020. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought it started earlier than that. It might have been anyway, 18 yeah. and 19. Yeah, what we noticed was that artists were often the no, first was... ones to offer help, whether that yeah. was you know yep. that was obvious them. wasn't it yeah. in the 2020 fires yeah yeah that's right and again um ben quilty's um running an auction for um you know yeah um, afghanistan yeah afghanistan. yeah um and so you know artists often have the least and give the most and so we started this project as uh yeah a real um way that artists could use their skills but not have to put too much of themselves out there like a badge is not a very big commitment it could be if you wanted it to be or you could just mm -hmm. make something small and send it as a token um yeah with that hopeful message um that, that's a lovely thing to do for artists as well isn't mm -hmm. it not just to be able to make make climate action but to demonstrate um that you don't have to give everything yeah yeah yeah, nice. Yeah. Wow, cool. Jane's asked about um, something here. She said, can you tell us about the Collective Haunt Studios and how that is run? Oh, oh this, good this from question, Jane. Yeah. Jane. <laughs> I hope I can um, do it justice. Um, so the Collective Haunt was begun by Jane Skier. Who's um, on here somewhere, I think. Who's... I saw her in a car. Yep. I think. yep. Um, now, I think she initiated it because she was looking for a lovely big space for her own studio and couldn't find what she was looking for. So um, because she's who she is, she's a very proactive person. She thought, I'll start my own <laughs> studio. Um, and we're glad she did all 20 of us who are or 23 22 mm -hmm. artists who are in here so um it's quite a large space it's divided into a range of different size studios with a gallery in the middle um and so there are monthly exhibitions in the gallery um as well as the artists just doing their own thing in in their individual studios um it's run as a not-for-profit obviously um and so just, you know, our rent keeps the thing afloat um, with the great support of Jane and Brett. Yeah, it's great. And Jane kicked off. She was our very first Duck and Weave Meet the Maker speaker oh, fantastic. last year. Yeah. Right, right. Yes, well, she's a great support um, for all the artists here. And, you know, 
I haven't got room at home to make work um, except, you know, to sew <laughs> underwear. <laughs> um, but the other thing about working in a communal studio um, is, you know, the social aspect, talking to other artists, um, bouncing ideas off them. Yeah, it's a, a really lovely way to, um, I don't know, to work alongside other artists. Well, and that's what the buzz we had yesterday after, after, you know, there was six of us yesterday. Yeah, it was um, a good example of just how necessary professional development is and yeah. how we want to prioritise it. That's right, yep. And whether that's in a formal thing like a, a forum or um, professional development formally, or you know you just turn up at the studio and it happens that your neighbor across the way is there and you have a spontaneous conversation about you know what painting medium you use or it's just a really nice flowing um way to be part of that community yeah well we're looking at it wrapping up is there any other questions Do you, is there anything else you wanted to share? Oh, nothing I can think of at the moment. I'll probably finish and think, oh, I forgot to say blah, blah. <laughs> um, just thanks for having me, I, I, I think, you know. Oh, well, thank you for being part of it. Like, yeah, and so this morning's been an interesting juggle. So thanks for coping <laughs> with, the, with the juggling. That's okay, no, well done. I did think, what if I forgot my laptop because I've already dropped a kid somewhere and then come to the studio and yeah before I left home I thought oh, nearly forgot my laptop so I understand. yeah we do have lives don't we like yeah. it is that's kind of what what the whole conference is about is like how do you slide that in yeah but I don't know whether play-doh play would have helped me in this situation well yeah maybe like a stress play-doh ball would have been oh great. yeah <laughs> excellent all right, well, Great. we might thank you and then I'm going to swap. <laughs>